Well, here we go. It's been three years since the Navi codename appeared on AMD roadmaps, originally set for a tentative 2018 release with no other details supplied other than the fact that it would be using next gen memory. Navi would follow Vega, which was delayed, pushing the newer architecture back to well now, making it AMD's first architecture designed from the ground up for seven nanometer fabrication. But it's fair to say the initial promising performance numbers fell flat once AMD announced pricing. In a world where gamers treated Nvidia's RTX prices as too high, AMD failed to provide any disruptive alternative. An 11th hour rethink puts Navi back into contention, but even with $30 and $50 cuts to pricing, it's actually fast enough. We're going to find out how the new RX 5700 and 5700 XT perform in this video and how they stack up in a world where Nvidia's new Super RTX refresh sees the GeForce crew go some way into addressing the big pricing issues. So here we are then. Radeon RX 5700 and the XT are both based on the new RDNA architecture and both actually use the same Navi 10 processor. Quick look at the two cards confirms that both are using the same PCB, differentiation coming in the form of slight spec adjustments and a different shroud. The 5700 gets a hefty but basic looking casing with a nice finish around the blower there. There's no backplate on this one so you do get to see the rear of the PCB which personally I kind of like. The XT model has the same power inputs and display outputs but it has a more deluxe finish a back plate and of course the somewhat bizarre thing happening there at the top of the casing. Reminds me of when I had a desk lamp shining over the top of my monitor which gradually melted the top of its casing. The sense with both cards though is that they're competently built but not exactly spectacular. Yes we have a blower and I really wish AMD would stop doing that or at least release partner cards at the same time so users get a choice. AMD says that venting heat out of the back of the case is better for more users who may not have enthusiast grade cooling in their cases but even Nvidia has given up on the blower now and AIBs only seem to use it for bargain basement cards. But I digress, both the 5700 and the XT have the same 6 pin and 8 pin power inputs along with the same video output ports. So that'll be three display ports and an HDMI 2.0. The DP ports support DCC compression meaning that 4K 120 and other insane resolution refresh rate combos can be carried out without chroma subsampling and across a single cable on compatible monitors that is like this massively expensive ASUS example. So let's take a quick look at specs. Both of the new Navi cards are using the Navi 10 chip, but the basic 5700 is a salvage part, meaning that there are slight defects on the silicon, necessitating deactivation of some of the compute units. So there's 36 CUs active on the 5700, and a full complement of 40 active on the XT. Clock speeds also get a tweak on the XT side too. The good news though is that AMD hasn't gimped the memory on the lower end model. Both feature 8 gigs of GDDR6 across a 256-bit bus, meaning 448 gigabytes per second of bandwidth on both cards. So what should we be looking at in performance terms then? AMD's own benchmarks talked about a 10% average uplift for the 5700 over the 2060 RTX card and a 6% improvement over the RTX 2070 for the higher end XT. Prices dropped on the 2060, the 2060 Super effectively replaced the 2070 and a new 2070 S delivered performance comparable to the much more expensive Radeon 7. So yeah, we had that last minute AMD response. Drop prices on the 5700 to match the RTX 2060 and reposition XT against the 2060S at 400 of your US bucks. And from my perspective, lowering prices has proved essential. Before AMD cut them, they were hopelessly outmatched. I still think there are questions to answer about pricing, but the firm is in a much more comfortable position now, no doubt about it. In this video, I'm going to concentrate on the 5700, which is arguably the better product overall. Yeah, similar to Vega 56, the cutbacks AMD has made don't harm performance, 
that much in too many games and up against RTX 60 what you lack in advanced forward looking rendering features you gain with the provision of an extra 2 gigs of VRAM. So I'll have a 5700 XT performance video coming up shortly, hopefully alongside this one. Have to see how the schedule goes there. Anyway, so I rendered out these benchmarks before AMD did its last minute price cut thing. So the inclusion of the 2060 Super is perhaps better geared to the XT. But, you know, let's go with it. Again, I consider these great 1440p cards, so that's what I'm concentrating on here. Check out our full review on Eurogamer for all the stats you need at 1080p and 4K resolution as well. I've expanded out the benchmarks for this review a little, but let's kick off with a game that has known issues for AMD hardware, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. We're looking at effective parity with the RTX 2060 here across the whole run, with a 12-point lead for the 2060 Super. Vega 64 is interesting. We're looking at a 64 compute unit part losing 13% of performance up against a 36 CU Navi part. In terms of a gen on gen improvement, I'd say that's pretty good. Though of course Vega 64 prices will be dropping like a stone now. I was thinking that Nvidia has its own Turing card without RTX features, uh, GTX 1660 Ti, but as you can see here, even in a game that challenges AMD, the 5700 is 17% ahead at 1440p. Not a bad start then for a game that really isn't friendly to AMD GPUs. And while we're talking about Assassin's Creed, our legacy Unity benchmark has a depth of field effect that has historically tanked AMD performance and you can see that here with our legacy Vega 64 testing but you'll also see that Navi seems to be immune to this particular effect. You get a 3.5% lead here for the 5700 against 2060, and that's an 11% boost over Vega 64. From games that are hostile to AMD to a title that absolutely loves Radeon, Battlefield 5, and you've got to wonder why all games can't be this performant for Team Red. A 16-point lead, for Radeon here over RTX 2060, and it's just a little short of matching 2060S performance, with the gap actually widening at 4K. In point of fact, the 2070 Super costs $150 more and only gives you 10% more frame rate. Right, so Battlefield 1, pretty old, right? I prefer benchmarking existing games where the driver optimizations are done and the developer input is basically over. But let's see how Battlefield 1 looks for a moment. I see a whopping great 15 point lead for the 5700 over 2060 and a 4 point advantage compared to 2060 Super. I don't see the same colossal performance increase that AMD does in its official benchmarks but obviously it's still a big, big advantage. Battlefield loves AMD, it's official. Far Cry 5 is also well tuned for AMD, a touch faster than RTX 2060 Super totally on par with a 2070 across the length of the bench and with a 14% advantage over the standard 2060. Pretty good going, but the Vega 64 holds firm here. It's only about 5% slower than the 5700. And yeah, there's actually a similar pattern in the intensively GPU heavy Ghost Recon Wildlands at Ultra settings. This one does tend to play havoc with GPU scaling across the stack, but you get a 9% lead over 2060 and that 5700, it's on par with 2060 Super, and just a point off 2070. Vega is left for dust. 36 compute units with Navi deliver 12% more performance than 64 Vega CUs. So it's all looking pretty decent for the 5700, but we can't underestimate the power of the price drop. Before AMD lopped off $30, you were looking at a card that at best is mostly on par with 2060 Super, but can fall short and doesn't have any forward-looking rendering features like hardware accelerated ray tracing. By adjusting to the new 2060 pricing, AMD can retain an advantage. It delivers two gigs more memory and it's pretty much always faster than that 2060. And speaking of faster, what is it with AMD's obsession with Rebellion Strange Brigade? Well, I decided to take a look. It's DX12 and Vulkan Support 2 plus toggleable async compute. I guess it's built on an offshoot of the Sniper Elite engine that AMD has championed in the past. Well, there are no surprises here then. 5700 is 14% faster than 2060 and within spitting distance of the 2060 Super, actually beating it at 1080p and 4K. 
So it's a good turnout overall then, but weirdness prevails in Metro Exodus. I just get a black screen running the benchmark, but the introduction to the vulgar level can wreak havoc on both CPU and GPU. At 1080p, the 2060 is actually faster owing to CPU bottlenecks, strongly suspecting a driver issue here, even though we're running under DX12. Balance is restored to the force at 1440p though, with a 12 point lead for the 5700 over 2060, though it is 3% short of 2060 Super, and the 2070 Super loves those CUDA cores, it's 16% faster. The trend pretty much continues as you would expect then. Rise of the Tomb Raider delivers a 9 point lead over 2060, 2 to 4 points off 2060 Super and 2070, pretty much exactly where AMD would have wanted to pitch this part based on its Computex presentation. Interestingly though, Vega 64 manages to keep up pretty well, which I didn't expect. The lead actually extends over RTX 2060 in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, up to 14% and the Vega 64 is now 7 points off the pace. The 5700 is doing a good job here of comprehensively besting the 2060, while at the same time moving closer towards 2060 Super and 2070 performance, though those Turing cards do see their leads actually extend at 4K resolution. Of course, it wouldn't be a Digital Foundry GPU review without a high-speed gallop through Novigrad in The Witcher 3. It's a game that often throws up some curiosities, but actually it's very well behaved with Navi. The further up the resolution scale you go, the better the performance differentials in favor of the 5700. But at our chosen 1440p, we're only 3% faster than the 2060, with 2060 Super and 2070, six and nine points to the better. What I will say is that similar to Assassin's Creed Unity, we do get better stability over Vega with the lurching stutters I see on Vega 64 and Radeon 7 gone. It's a shame that the same can't be said for Wolfenstein The New Colossus. Our run through the beginning of the New Orleans stage sees the same kind of lurching stutter I've observed on other AMD cards I've put through this test. That's a bit of a shame as I actually record a slight lead overall for the 5700 over the 2060 Super and a gigantic 24% advantage over RTX 2060. And we'll finish off with my perennial favorite, Crisis 3. Can throw off many modern GPU architectures, but it seems generally okay with Navi, but it's not exactly a spectacular turnout. Five point lead over Vega 64 and across the whole benchmark run, it's much the same as the 2060. 2060 Super and the outgoing 2070 are significantly ahead, however. But you know, that's XT territory. I wanna close off with a very quick look at how the two Navi cards compare and why I'd recommend the 5700 over the XT. So let's look at a game that doesn't like the new cards that much to begin with. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Yes, we're going back there. At 1440p, the XT is only 8.5% faster uh, than the standard 5700, which isn't particularly impressive for what's supposed to be a higher end card. And in turn, 2060 Super, clearly a faster product. Battlefield 1, well, that's a game that loves and adores AMD kit, as we have established, and the XT can only muster an 11% advantage over the standard 5700. But a closer look at XT performance is something I'll be looking at in another video. There are some oddities with Navi though. Yes, Battlefield 5 performance is awesome with the 5700, but what's going on with the loading times? They're horrifically bad as it is, but loading up the Provence level takes a colossal three minutes, 13 seconds on Navi versus one minute, eight seconds on an RTX 2060. Both are hideously long results for a game running from an SSD, but Navi's almost intolerable here kind of weird. Also, despite Navi running on a 7 nanometer process, found the 5700 to be louder than my RTX 2060, likely because we're looking at one fan rather than two, while the power consumption of the 5700 is a touch higher than the 2060, probably equalizing out since the 2060 is running my Crisis 3 power test scene here at a slightly lower frame rate. Bottom line though, AMD has required an entire process shrink in order to be competitive in efficiency against Nvidia. That's not great. Right, well, let's wrap this all up then. In many ways, I'm reminded of Vega 56 with this one. A 
a strong AMD product that provided minor disruption in the market against the super popular GTX 1070 back in the day. 5700 is undeniably faster than the RTX 2060 and in its element, it's up there with the 2060 Super. It's pretty good going. I also think having two gigs of extra memory is important and definitely adds to the value when it's priced on par with the 2060. But there are minus points. Pricing's definitely not disruptive. There's value here, but you know, it's not gonna change perceptions of the Radeon brand. And obviously Turing has forward-looking features that Navi completely lacks. By the end of next year, We'll have two consoles out there with ray tracing support and console utilization of that feature means that what is now an interested value added effect transforms into part of the baseline design for multi-format games. Chances are Navi will have this feature next year since that's when the consoles will appear based on the same architecture. And with RT support built into key games coming up like Cyberpunk, New Call of Duty, Watch Dogs and the like, I kind of want this feature in a GPU I'm buying today. Whether you do though, well that's entirely up to you. Okay, so as I said, I'll be looking at XT performance in more depth in another video, so look out for that one. But that's all from me for now. As usual, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this work, and of course, yes, ring the notification bell for a nice pop-up whenever a new DF video is posted. And you know what comes next, a plug for the DF Patreon where you can access pristine quality download versions of every video we produce. Yeah, I'm kind of making light of it, but seriously, helping the team more directly makes a hell of a lot of difference in being able to produce this kind of content on our terms. But anyway, that's where I'm leaving everything for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video, if indeed you did, and just generally, thanks for watching.